Good morning, everyone. It's Rabbi Akiva Mails. Today is Friday, July 10th, and we're getting ready for Shabbos Parshas Pinchas. I want to start by wishing a great big mazel tov to Sam and Pat Shapitz on the engagement of their granddaughter, Yael Roth, to Sender Gelbut. Mazel tov to Sam, Pat, the entire Shapitz, Roth, Gelbut families. May they have much nachas from their new couple, and may Yael and Sender have a future that's filled with health, happiness, and success in all they set out to accomplish. We also want to wish a great big mazel tov to new members of our community, to Dr. Josh and Jen Wise, and the, uh, their daughter, Tani, becoming a bat mitzvah this Shabbos. We wish them a great big mazel tov. May you always have much nachas from Tani and from each and every one of your children. I want to share with you this Shabbos a fascinating Dvar Torah relating to uh, something I had, saw that I had seen this week. There was a great rabbi who was very, very well known in Lithuania in the 19th century and at the end of his life in Yerushalayim in Israel. And he was known by his acronym, the Aderes. Aderes was an acronym for Rabbi Elio David Rabinowitz Tumim. Rabbi Elio David Rabinowitz Tumim was an outstanding Eloi, he was a genius, and he was very well known in Lithuania. And as I said, the end of his life in Yerushalayim. He served as a Rav in many, many, two very famous towns in Lithuania in Panovich and in the town of Mir. Both of them are well known because of the yeshivas that still carry their name. And at the end of his life, he moved to Eretz Yisrael where he served as a rabbi in Yerushalayim. Uh, he passed away in 1905 at a relatively young age. Not even, not even 70, just, just shy of 70 years old. By the way, the Aderes, Rebbe Leo, David Rabinowitz Tomim is well known for a famous son-in-law he had. He had a very famous son-in-law by the name of Rabbi Avraham Yitzchak HaKohen Cook, that was a son-in-law of the Aderes. So I want to share with you something absolutely fascinating. I saw quoted in the name of the Aderes, it ties to this week's Parsha. I had to look it up in the original because this just blew my mind. Just to put this in context, we're used to the idea that you go into Shul and there could be a number of Avelim, there could be a number of people who are in a state of mourning, they could be at various stages of their mourning. Some might be in Shloshim, some might be in the Yud Beis Chodesh, in the, in the, the year of saying Kaddish, some might have Yurt site. And when it comes time for a Kaddish Yasom, but for the mourners Kaddish, they all recite Kaddish together. That was not always the case in Ashkenaz. In Ashkenazic communities, classic Minag Ashkenaz was that there would be one person at a time reciting Kaddish. And it was up to the Gabai in the Shul to decide who had Kadima, who had priority to recite that Kaddish. In some communities that still keep all the original Minhage Ashkenaz, that's still the case. I know, for example, in Washington Heights in New York, in the famous Breuer's Kehila, Kala Das Yishurin, that's still the case. If someone is saying Kaddish, the first thing they do when they come to Shul is check in with the Gabai, let them know where exactly they are. He assesses who has Kadima, who has priority, and he assigns a different Kaddish Yasom for, for each person. Again, uh, that's not the case in most, in, I would say in just about all uh, Ashkenazic communities now, we, we, all recite, we have all the mourners recite that Kaddish together. But one could imagine that at a time when there was just one person at a time reciting Kaddish, this could lead to some contention because people get very emotional about these things and people want to say Kaddish for a loved one. We might see this play itself out as far as davening for the Amud in terms of who might want to serve as a shliach tzibor, but again, I think that pales in comparison to the issues that, were, that the, that the Gabayim were faced with in a situation when people would only say one Kaddish, one person would recite Kaddish at a time for Kaddish Yasom. So that's the context in what the Adaris, what I'm going to share with you, something the Adaris wrote. The Adaris was faced with the following qu- question. I'll read it to you. This was in one of his farm. It's very short. He says, Bedine Kaddish, when it comes to priority about who should have the right to say Kaddish, he says, Amarti, I've said, and as I've said for many years now, the following idea. If there was one person who went knocking on doors and putting the minion together, and without him, the minion never would have taken place. So there was one person who was out there collecting everybody and bringing them to Shul so there should be a minion. If this person wants to say Kaddish after he put in all that legwork, he put in all that sweat equity, you might say, to put this minion together, and now someone shows up and says, I've got yard site. And now we might say, oh my gosh, give that guy Kadima, give that guy priority for Kaddish. That Darius wanted to say, no, Kaddish goes to that one who worked so hard, who hustled to put that minion together, that person gets Kaddish. What's that based on? 
So he says, Viraya Ladavar, what's a proof to this? Medivre Asifri, based on the Medrash, who perish Rashi, and Rashi brings it down in this week's Parsha, but Parsha's Pinchas. The Pasuk Yifkod Elokea Ruchos, that in, it's in Perak Chabzayan, chapter 27 in Bamidbar. So this is Moshe Rabbeinu turns to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and he says, Yifkod Hashem Elokei Ruchos, L'chol Basar Ishal Oida. Let God, who's the Lord of spirits of all flesh, appoint the man over the congregation. That Moshe Davins to Hashem, I need a successor. I need someone who's going to take over and lead Klal Yisrael. And Rashi brings down, we'll read the Rashi fully in a second there. Rashi brings down and he says, Shamar Leah Kodesh Baruch Hu Moshe Rabbeinu, God says to Moshe, Notzer Te'ena Yochel Piria, the one who guarded the, the fig tree, he's the one who should eat its fruits. We'll soon see what that means. Veskimuli Kama Ga'onim. And many of the leading rabbinic authorities of Lithuania, they all agreed with my reasoning. What is this Pasuk? What is this Rashi that the Adaris is quoting? So let's read it. We just read the Pasuk inside. That Moshe is turning to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and he's asking Hashem, I know that my end is near. Please appoint a worthy successor. So listen to Rashi. Rashi quotes the Medrash, and we'll get back to the Medrash at the end. Rashi says as follows. Kivon shishama Moshe, shamar lo hamakom tenachlas tzalavchad libnosav. As soon as Moshe, what prompted Moshe to start asking for a successor? Well, what prompted him was right before this, look at the juxtaposition, right before this incident is the, is the episode of the daughters of Tzlavchad, that they were asking of Moshe to ask, consult of Hashem, what do we do? Their father passed away in the Midbar. He was not part of any of the uprisings against Moshe or against Hashem, and he didn't have any sons. So who's going to get the inheritance? Moshe takes their case before Hashem, and Hashem answers that, yes, the, go- the girls, the daughters, and will inherit, and he gives a set of criteria as to how these laws will play themselves out in the future. So as soon as Moshe hears this, that the daughters of Tzlavchad will get some of their father's inheritance, Omar, Moshe thinks to himself, he says to himself, he says, it's now is the time for me to ask for my needs. Now is the time if I see the daughters of Tzlavchad are inheriting his position, his standing and getting his land, now's the time to ask Hashem that my children should inherit my uh, position of authority. Amr Allah Kodesh Baruch but God says to Moshe, no, it doesn't work that way. It's not what I'm thinking. I hear your request. I know that you want your sons, Gershon, Eliezer, you want them to take over for you, but that's not what I'm thinking. It is Kedai, it's worthy, Yehoshua. Your, your loyal student, Yoshua, he's the one who should succeed you. And, and, and why? So he should get the schar shimusho. He should be uh, rewarded for how much service he put into helping you. Shalomash mitocha oel. He never left the tent. He was always there to help you in your times of needs and learn from you. Zeo shamar shlomo. And this is what Shlomo Melech says. Notzer te'ena yochel peria. The one who guards the fig tree, he's the one who should be awarded with the fruit, meaning getting, uh, being allowed to eat the fruit. The Pasuk ends by saying, that's a Pasuk in Mishlei. It's in Mishlei, Chavzayin, it's 27 in Mishlei, Pasuk, 18, Pasuk Yudches, 18. The Pasuk says, no certaina yochel piria, the one who guards the fig tree should eat its fruit, be awarded by eating its fruit. The Shomer Adonav Yechubad, and the guardian of his master will be honored. So Hashem is saying to Moshe that therefore Yehoshua is the one who should succeed you as a reward for how much he looked after you how much he was attentive to your needs and served you. That's what Hashem tells Moshe. So what did that Deris do with this? Based on the Pasuk of Notzer Te'ena Yochal Pirya, the one who guards the fig tree should be the one to eat the rewards. He says, that's why the one who hustled to put the minion together, without him, the minion never would have gotten together. That person has Kadima, that person has priority for saying Kaddish, even more than a yard site, the more than someone, whatever the priority could have been, that person has priority. Why? Because without him, this never would have come to fruition. I saw the same idea applied to more cases. In the Sefer Mata Ephraim, which has a lot of the halachas brought down about how do we run a minion and all the minhagim that are involved in that, when it comes to the laws of Kaddish, one of the commentaries, one of the prime commentaries on the Mata Ephraim is, it's called Elif Hamagen. Elif Hamagen was written by a Rabbi Mishalom Finkelstein. Now, this is, again, a, a European, a European uh, rav in the 19th century. And look how he extends this. He quotes this idea of the Adaris, and he extends it. He says, chazen, The shliach tzibur, whoever was the balkore who was reading the Torah, let's say it was a Monday or Thursday, or let's say it was a Shabbos, we all know there's a chatzikadosh after the laning. 
So he says the Balkare who read the Torah, Shomrim Chatsi Kara Shachar Kriasa Torah, Kol Elu Heim Kodim Lashar Avelim. He says, May I time up for this reason? That person has priority to say that Kaddish. Meaning, he says an Avel might come up, and I actually have seen this happen. I was at a minion where I saw this happen. I'd never seen this before. Someone was in the midst of a year of saying Kaddish for a loved one. He went up to the Balkare and he says, I'd like to say the Chatsi Kaddish after laning. The Balkare is looking at him, what are you doing? So he says, no, I'm saying Kaddish, I'm in the year, and I want to say as many Kaddishim as possible, so I'd like to say this Kaddish after the laning. And the Chazan says, but it's not a Kaddish Yasam, it's not a mourner's Kaddish. He says, I don't care, I want to say the Kaddish. That was the person's reaction. I, I was scratch mad, I never saw something like this before. This is exactly what the Aleph Amagian is addressing here. He's saying, no, who has rights to that Kaddish? The Balkare, because if it wasn't for laning, that Kaddish wouldn't be said. So therefore, it's the Balkare who should say that Kaddish. That's how he's extending the Adaris. He quotes the Adaris. He says that many go on him and when he agreed with them. And he says, I'll extend it to this case as well. That's what he does with that. Absolutely, absolutely fascinating. So here we have this Medrash that Rashi quotes, and it has practical applications. Again, we may not see this play itself out. The Adaris was discussing a case where uh, that Deris was discussing a case where there was only one person reciting Kaddish at a time. So who has Kadima who has priority? He says the one who put the minion together. And what did the Aleph Amagian said? Who has Kadima in the case of, if you have an Aval, says, I want to say that Chatsi Kaddish after laning? He says, it's the Balkari. He's the one who did the laning. And without the laning, there wouldn't have been a Kaddish. That's Not Sertaino Yochal Piria. How could this play itself out in a, a, nowadays, aside from that laning case? But how could it play itself out now where it would be, we have multiple Avelim saying Kaddish at the same time. So it could be in terms of who has Kadima, who has priority for davening for the Tzibor. I saw Rav Zilberstein in Israel, he builds off of this Adaris to say, what well, Adaris was talking about who has priority to say Kaddish, he applied this as well to davening for the Amud. He says, let's say you have a case where someone has yard site for their grandparent. There's really no such thing as yard site for a grandparent because it, 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 it's, 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 it's nice if a grandchild wants to say Kaddish, that's fine. But if there's someone who's in the year of, of, of Avelis for a parent, that person always has priority. Someone who's, who's saying Kaddish for a parent always has priority over someone for a grandparent. So if, let's say you add two people in Shul. One says, I'd like to daven Mincha because it's a yard site for a grandparent. And one person says, uh, I'd like to daven because that person's in the year for a parent or in the yard site for a parent. The one for the parent will always come first. So the, the Rev Zilberstein in Israel wanted to take this Adaris to this case and say, what if that one with the grandparent, he plugs it into the Adaris case? He hustled to put the minion together. No one was coming to show. And the guy who's got your site for a grandparent hustled. He knocked on doors. He schlucked people out of bed in their pajamas. He brought them to show for Marav. And now he wants to daven for Naman because it's the Zayda's uh, yard site. And now one person says, one second, why does he have priority? This person says he should have priority because it's for a parent. But Zilberstein wanted to apply based on notes certain Yochal Peria, the one who worked for it, the one who really guarded the fig tree, gets to eat the fruit. He wanted to apply it to, to this case as, as well. I thought that was absolutely fascinating how a medrash that's quoted by Rashi in this week's Parsha could have halachic implications for Kaddish and for davening for the Amud. I thought that's absolutely fascinating. But I want to share with you, let's look at this medrash in, in, in its original source. This medrash that talks about Moshe Rabbeinu asking Hashem, for a successor, initially thinking it should be one of his sons, and Hashem telling him, no, it should be Yoshua. I found it in the Medrash Rabbah, and I want to read it to you in the original, because it's a beautiful Medrash, and it'll bring home something that happened this week with us at Young Israel. And here we go. The Medrash says as follows. This is going on the Pasuk of, Moshe says to Hashem, Yifkod Hashem Elokei Ruchos. Hashem, it's, again, it's in Perach of Zion 27, it's Pasuk, Tesvav 15 and 16. So it says as follows. Uh, what was Moshe asking from Hashem? So the Medrash writes, Why is Moshe now asking for a successor after this whole business about inheriting uh, a land in Israel comes up and the daughters of Tzlavchad? So he says, Now that the daughters of Tzlavchad were given permission to inherit for their father, Amar Moshe, Moshe says, Now is the time to ask for my needs to be met. If the daughters of Slavchod could inherit their father, then it makes sense that my sons should inherit my position of authority. God says to Moshe, no, 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 the one who guarded the fig tree, that's the one who should eat the fruit. Then he writes to Moshe, this is a little harsh. He says, he says to Moshe, your sons, 
they sat and they kind of, they didn't make the most of their time and their energies and their mind power, their resources. They didn't fully engage in Torah learning like they should have. Yoshua, but Yoshua, Harbe Sheri Rascha, he served you. Harbe Chalak Lachakavod, he went out of his way to give you Kavod and honor. Now, again, I just want to point out here it can't be that Moshe's sons were just Batlanim. They just never learned a word in their lives and they were ignoramuses. If that's the case, Moshe never would have had a Havamina, never would have had an initial thought that they should succeed him. Obviously, they were people who had uh, uh, some accomplishments under their belt. But nonetheless, Hashem's telling him they didn't make full use. They didn't, make, they didn't actualize their potential. Yeshua did. So he says, we're going to pass up your, your children who didn't actualize their potential. But again, I'm sure they were, they, they were heavyweights in their own right, but they didn't actualize their potential. And we're going to reward Yeshua. Why? Because of how much he served you. And the Medrash goes on to say, he says, Yeshua harbe shereshcha. Yeshua served, served you greatly. Harbe chalak kavod. He did everything he could to increase your honor. He was the first one in yeshiva every morning, and he was the last one there in the evening. He was learning with you all day long. Not only did he learn with you and actualize his potential, but he also invested sweat equity. He rolled up his sleeve. He set up the chairs, the benches, the tables. He did all that. He set up the base medrash. He set up the carpets. I guess it was a dirt floor. So he wanted the base matters to be clean and nice. He rolled out the carpets every day. And he cleaned up. You could imagine he was there with the vacuum cleaner and the brush, the broom. He was the one sweeping afterwards, shutting out the lights, turning them on in the morning. Since he put in all of his energies to serve you and to learn from you, he should be the one to serve as the next leader of Israel because he should not lose his, uh, his reward. And that's why Hashem says to him, he should be the one to be rewarded because of how much he put in to help you, to learn from you, and to serve you. And this is in fulfillment of the verse of Mishlei, that the one who guards the fig tree should be the one to eat the fruits. I think this is a beautiful medrash and it sends a lesson home to us. How important it is, number one, to actualize our potential, make the most of the gifts that God has given us, and, and to put them in his service. But number two, look what the Medrash is saying about Yoshua. It's not just that he gave Moshe a lot of kavod and that he was always learning from him. But look at all the mundane, you might say mundane activities, he put in to the base Medrash to keep, the, to keep that study hall going. He was the one setting up the chairs. He was the one taking care of the carpets and the rugs, sweeping up. That was Yoshua turning on the lights, turning off the lights. What the Medrash is doing is it's praising us, saying, don't ever think that there's anything belittling about investing sweat equity, time, and energies into a shul, into a base Medrash. That's all Kodesh. That's all Tzar Sibor. That's all communal needs. And Yoshua was rewarded for that, for having rolled up his sleeves. This isn't something to be considered belittling. This isn't something to hire out and to... Uh, and to say, who can I get to do this? It's a, it's a cover. It's an honor to roll up our sleeves and get involved with Avodah HaKodesh, doing what we can, even the seemingly mundane features, to keep a shul, to keep a base medrash functioning. Even if that means cleaning up, setting up the chairs, turning, turning on the lights, off the lights, all those things, that's all part of Avodah HaKodesh, and Yoshua was rewarded for that. I want to take this moment to recognize something uh, eventful, which occurred this week at Young Israel. We weren't able to have our annual meeting in person, but we had it on Zoom. And at this annual meeting, we thanked Jonathan Kaplan for four years of having served four years as president of Young Israel of Memphis. And during those four years, Jonathan wore many, many different hats. He invested an incredible amount of time, energy, and resources into helping our show. And amongst the many hats that he wore in the capacity as president is exactly what the Medrash is talking about, Yoshua. It wasn't beneath him to get involved in being Misader as Hasaf Solim, to setting up the chairs and the benches, doing what he can in that regard. Ruhu Pores as Hamachtsalos, and doing what he can to roll out the carpet, clean the carpet. You, all of us have seen him with a broom after Kiddush cleaning up. These are things that Jonathan has taught us and has made very, very clear to us that it's not beneath any of us to get involved in the seemingly mundane features and, and aspects of maintaining our beloved show. He's made this very clear and he's led by example. So all of us want to thank Jonathan. And of course, we want to thank a Abby, who's uh, enabled Jonathan to spend so much time and effort doing everything he can to support and to assist our shul in its avodah sakodesh and its holy tasks. 
And our heartfelt tefillah is, as we dive in every Shabbos, is that we should say, anyone who involves themselves with communal service and great faithfulness, Hashem should reward them for all their efforts. And that's our heartfelt tefillah for Jonathan, as well as Abby and the whole family. Thank you very much for your four years of devoted leadership to our shul and everything you did for it. And I also want to recognize we have a new incoming president, and that's John Logan. And John has already showed himself in all of his years as being involved with Young Israel, and especially in the projects that he's very, very busy with now. Chief amongst them, our building project. Jonathan has showed himself that he's willing and he's, he has invested an incredible amount of time, energy, resources into everything that's related with our shul. And he's shown that it's not beneath him. To, just like as what we said about Jonathan, just like we said about Yehoshua, Jonathan, John Wogan has shown it's not beneath him to get involved with setting up the chairs and the mundane features of shul. That's not beneath him. And he leads by example as well. And God bless him, his wife, Sarah Bracha, she's fully supportive of all of his efforts and allowing him to put in this type of time and these efforts and these resources, investing them into our shul. May HaKadosh Baruch Hu bless the, uh, John and Sarah Bracha, the entire family, with all that they daven for and all that we daven for when we say, anyone who's involving themselves with these great communal tasks, we wish John incredible success in his tenure as president of our shul. And we're certain that he will follow the example of his predecessor, of Jonathan Kaplan, but more importantly, of Yoshua Benon, of being a trustworthy steward of our shul, just like Yoshua was of the base medrash of Moshe Rabbeinu, and he'll do everything he can. He'll roll up his sleeves and lead by example. And God willing, all of us should follow his example to see what it is that we can do, even without being asked, what is it? How can we pitch in? How can we help? How can we help to uh, move our show from its current stage to its future? And God willing, it'll be a beautiful future that we all look forward to being a part of. Have a good Shabbos, everyone. Thank you again to Jonathan. And thank you to John for stepping into this role. We wish you nothing but Hatzlacha. Have a good Shabbos, everyone.